uh, let's really honor to be able to invite Dr. Uh, Hamd Rajabi. Yeah, I checked it online. It's Ham or Hamd. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> Ham Rajabi from London South Bank University. Uh, this session belongs to the biology-based engineering at London South Bank University. Uh, it belongs to the the forum of Frontiers in Bionic Engineering Online Academic Forum. Uh, and uh, uh, it is hosted by the International Society of Bionic Engineering uh, with the abbreviation of ISB and organized by Youth Commi Commi Commission of the ISB. And it is sponsored by, sponsored by the uh, non-high branch of Shandong Province uh, Foreign Expert Station and chaired by uh, me, Dr. Jenny Wu from CSN University. I'm really honored to be here to share uh, with you and have a talk with Dr. Hamid Rajabi today. Uh, Dr. Ham Rajabi is a senior lecturer in the School of Engineering at London South Stewart, huh? Bank University. He has made a significant impact on the, on the uh, biomechanics of insect winds and how they are currently studied. Dr. Rajabi has published over 60 articles most of which have been published in the top interdisciplinary journals, for instance, like Science Robotics, uh, PAS Advanced Science. Uh, in the last year alone, at least seven of his articles were ranked in the top 5% of all research outputs scored by Ometric and ob obtained high attention scores. His re research has been featured by multiple science news outlets <laughs> physics.org, <laughs> new atlas, 3D printing industry. Uh, could you please mute your uh, microphone, please? Yeah. His research has been featured by multiple science uh, news outlets, for instance, physics.org, new atlas, 3D printing industry, and text explore. Uh, Dr. Rajabi is also uh, the editor of Applied uh, Physics, a Frontiers in Mechanical Engineering and a Journal of Bionic Engineering. He has received several uh, internationally recognized funding, such as Royal Society Research Grant, Royal Society International Exchange Grant, and the German Academic Exchange Service Research Grant. In 2021, Dr. Rajabi was endorsed as an ex exceptional promise by the Royal Academy of Engineering under the Global Talent category. And today's topic is about the presentation by Dr. Hamd Rajabi will take us on the journey in insect winds. Through the presentation, we will learn some uh, information about the complexity of insect wind design and the structural components that determine the functionality of the winds during flight. Um, winds are indeed adaptive structures that automatically change shape and adapt to flight forces. The presentation focuses on the mechanisms that facilitate the, the adaptability of the winds and the potential applications of those mechanisms in technology. Dr. Rajabi will also talk about some other designs inspired by biological systems, including the multi-degree freedom mechanical joint and adaptive robotic foods and insect-inspired gripper for industrial um, applications. The presentation is a brief review of the work of Dr. Rajabi and his team a bit before joining London South Bank University and after that. Uh, the diverse and vibrant team known as Mechanical Intelligence yeah, is the abbreviation uh, of MI research group focus on the understanding the complexities of the living systems by combining knowledge and expertise from different fields with the aim to develop life-inspired concepts and elaborate uh, it into a technology uh, readily level. So uh, we are really delighted to have Dr. Rajabi in our uh, session. And now uh, uh, let's take him in and uh, he will share uh, what he is doing now. And yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Jenny, for the very nice introduction. I'm going to share my screen. So um, thank you again, Jenny, for the very nice introduction. And hello, everyone. And uh, thank you for joining us today. It's a great pleasure to be with you and talk to you and share a little bit about the research that we do here at London South Bank University, so-called LSBU. I'm Hamid Rajabi, 
Uh, I'm a senior lecturer in mechanical engineering um, in the School of Engineering at LSPU. And I joined LSPU about two years ago. Um, before that, I was a postdoctoral researcher at Kiel University working with Professor Stanislav Gorb, um, where I also did my PhD, a PhD in biology there. And before that, I did another PhD in mechanical engineering. Um, and I think that that's why the research that we do uh, now at London South Bank University is very much at the interface of the two fields, engineering and biology. What we do uh, at LSBU is something that we call it as biology-based engineering. Some people maybe uh, prefer to call it as bio-inspired design or uh, biomimetics, but all of them are more or less the same in principle. Uh, what we do specifically is um, looking at biological systems, uh, trying to understand uh, to understand how biological systems work, how their material and structure uh, at different scales contribute to their function, and of course, what we can learn from biological systems to enhance the performance of engineering designs um, or even come up with innovative designs. Um, we do um, quite a lot of research on insects. In fact, in insects are one of our mod uh, main model uh, systems. And um, of course, there is a reason for that. And the reason is that insects are among uh, uh, the most successful animal groups on Earth. Uh, we know that there are more than 1 million described insect species and perhaps over 1 million trillion insects in the world. This slide um, gives you an idea about uh, the number of insect species compared with other taxa. As you can see here, the number of insect species exceeds the total number of species in all other taxa combined. And of course, this raises a question. Uh, what has made insects so evolutionary successful? Um, the answer to this question, in fact, lies in a unique combination of several characteristics, which as a whole has given insects an unusual survival advantage. And these characteristics are a robust exoskeleton, which forms their body and protects them against environmental factors, small body size, which reduces their energy consumption and gives them the opportunity to hide, uh, like productive potential, which enables them to produce large numbers of offspring, complete metamorphosis, in which any life stage is adapted for a certain purpose, for example, larval stage for feeding and growth, adult stage for reproduction and dispersal, and finally, the ability to fly. But um, among all these characteristics, the latter, meaning the flight ability, has played the most important role in the enormous success of insects. Uh, we know that compared with many flightless species, flying insects have obvious advantages in terms of foraging, mating, dispersal, and escaping predators. Um, as stated by David Wagner, although insects evolved about 400 million years ago, they became successful only after they became capable of flight. But how do insects fly? This is a question that my group and I are actively trying to answer. And this is in fact a very complicated question. Um, we know that of course flight is achieved uh, through highly special, uh, specialized outgrowth of the thoracic exoskeleton known as wings. These are known to be one of the most complex locomotor systems on Earth. They um, consist of structural components, which are both structurally and compositionally very complicated. I give you a few examples of these structural components of the wings that are very common um, in the wings of different species. And I tell you uh, what each of these structural components basically does in insect wings. 
One of the most common structural components of the wings are longitudinal veins. These are the veins that are extended from wing base to wing tip. These are the stiffening elements of the wings, and they are known for their very complex layered structure, as you can see here in, at the top left corner of the slide. Um, cross veins. These are the smaller veins that, that connect the large longitudinal veins to each other and prevent their lateral buckling. We also know that cross veins um, significantly increase the fracture toughness of the wing by acting as barriers against crack propagation. Um, membranes. These are, uh, um, in fact, uh, structures that fill the gap between the, between the veins, but they also work as a kind of stressed skin that stiffen the framework of veins. And by framework of veins, I mean these uh, small domains that you, you can see between the veins. Other structural components of the wings are vein microjoints. These are the intersecting point of veins. And as you can see here in this slide, they are distributed all over the wing and their large morphological variety provide wings with different levels of deformability in different wing regions. So uh, some of these um, uh, uh, joints are more flexible and some of them are more stiff. And interestingly, those, those that are stiffer can be found in those parts of the wing that require more support. And those ones that are more flexible can be found uh, on those parts of the wings that require more deformability. A series of very specialized uh, uh, joints. Here you can see the nodus, the uh, microscopy image of the nodus, which is situated in the middle of the leading edge of the wing. This is basically a one-way hinge, but also a, a structure that works as a kind of shock absorber, uh, especially when the wings are subjected to mechanical collisions. Um, spikes. These are basically mechanical stoppers. I told you that some of the uh, joints, for example, this one here, um, is designed or basically is in the in insect wings to increase the deformability. But deformability is needed to a certain degree. A very deformable wing cannot produce aerodynamic lift. So spikes are basically mechanical elements or mechanical stoppers that uh, to some extent tune the deformability of the joints by an interlocking effect. And a series of spikes that are distributed all over the wing surface, and nobody really knows about their real function. There are different hypotheses. There, some people think that they may have aerodynamic function, and some other people hypothesize that uh, spikes are basically mechanical weapons because insects use their wings uh, to fight with each other, which is really common in males, especially male dragonflies, which are some, sometimes very aggressive insects. But what is important from our pers perspective is the mechanical interaction between these wing components. Um, in fact, um, these wing components in insect wings have provided insect wings with a level of automatic shape control. In contrast to the wings of birds and bats, insect wings do not have any flight muscle. There is no flight muscle within insect wings. So all the deformations that we see in insect wings, including all these bending, twisting, camber formation, and everything is controlled by the design of the insect wings. And interestingly, as stated by Robin Button, one of the pioneers of the studies of wing biomechanics, the level of automatic shape control that we see in insect wings and is achieved by these structural components that, are, that I introduced earlier um, makes insect wings quite unique structures in the animal kingdom. We don't have any other example, neither in nature nor in technology, that has reached such a high level of automatic shape control. But uh, of course, we are engineers, and we would like to know what we can learn from shape morphing insect wings. Can we, for example, make adaptive structures that can adapt to um, loads or any kind of, um, uh, let's say, cir circumstance um, uh, without require requiring any active sensing, feedback, control, or actuation? So 
To answer this question, uh, in the last few years, my group and I have been focusing on one of these vein components, um, specifically uh, vein micro joints that I introduced earlier. Uh, as we know that these elements play a very significant role in the automatic shape control of insect wings. And using a variety of techniques, including imaging techniques, numerical modeling, optimization, mechanical testing, and 3D printing, we have been trying to understand how the design of the, of the vein joints influence their function in, in a complicated system like insect wings. One of the first designs that we developed is this fully 3D printed bio-inspired card. You may know that cards have a variety of technical applications, for example, in energy harvesting, for communication, or for transportation. But what makes this card, the card that we have designed, different from the existing cards is the presence of a joint in the middle of the card, here in the middle of the card, as I'm showing, that has provided our card with a level of adaptability. So we have tested this card in the out, outdoor environment, and we have seen that this adapt adaptability has provided our card not only with a better flight performance in comparison to conventional cards, but also with better durability. The card that we have designed can resist loads caused by winds over 80 kilometers per hour, Whereas we know that the conventional cards usually break in winds four times slower. Another design inspired by insect wings is this again fully 3D printed wrist splint. Um, it is a splint with about 20 gram mass that can resist loads over 30 kilogram. And as you can see here, the splint allows the rest flexion but prevents rest extension due to an inclusion of an interlocking uh, mechanism similar to the spikes that we have seen in insect wings, the mechanical stoppers that I mentioned earlier. The splint is intended to protect the rest of um, uh, weightlifters or other professional athletes against hyperextension injuries, but also to protect uh, the joints of patients after a surgery. Uh, another design that we uh, developed a few years ago, and the results were published in the journal Advanced Science, uh, is this collision-resistant airplane wing model, which resists typical flight forces, but elastically buckles up on collision due to an inclusion of a buckling region here, which is inspired by the specialized joint nodus you know, that was situated in the uh, leading edge of dragonfly wings and some other insects. So now I show you two high-speed video, videos. Uh, both have been uh, slowed down by 40 times. And in the first video, you can see that the wing that does not have this feature simply breaks up on collision when, um, uh, 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 to a rigid object. But our bio-inspired design simply buckles and re reversibly comes back to the original shape. Uh, by inspired joints also um, enabled us to control the deformation of engineering structures. I show you a very simple video, basically a rectangular plate that shows an asymmetric behavior when subjected to forces in two different directions. It's a very simple example and can be used, for example, as a kind of one-way valve. We are still working on this design, but Another interesting uh, application is, again, shape morphing structure. Here we have used the um, buoyant inspired joint in the design of columns, where we have been able to tune the deformability of columns. All of them have been subjected to the same displacement, but you see that any of them show a very different deformation pattern simply by adjusting the number and the design of buoyant inspired joints. Um, so uh, this is how we have used one design strategy from insect wings in different applications. Now I would like to show you another structure, very simple structure, but extremely effective. We have uh, recently published the data from this study in the journal PNAS. And this structure that you can see in this slide uh, is inspired by 
this specific structure that we have found in the hindwing of this beetle, which is a sun beetle. Uh, we saw this structure, we found this structure in the hindwing of this beetle, and we were very surprised because this structure exists in the membrane of the hindwing. But um, what is really interesting or surprising is that uh, we know in, uh, in the membrane of insect wings, membranes uh, consist of two layers that are perfectly fused into each other. But the structure that we, said, we can see here in the membrane of this uh, insect, in the membrane of the hindwing of this insect, consists of two layers. And there is a gap between the two layers, which, which was quite surprising for us. And of course, we were asking what the function of this structure could be. In order to understand uh, and answer the question, we made physical models of the same structure, scale it up, 3D printed the structure, and try to uh, play with the structure and, and subject it to loading. And as you can see here, when we subject the structure to compression, the structure simply buckles in one direction, but not to the opposite direction. And in fact, the structure is at least 10 times stiffer in one direction compared to the other direction. And so basically the structure is a kind of one-way hinge. And this makes sense because this structure can be found on the flexion line of the wings. And these flexion lines are basically insect wings to provide insect wings with an asymmetric behavior that contributes to the aerodynamic performance of the wings. So we made uh, many more um, uh, 3D printed parts. We tried to um, quantify and characterize the behavior of the structures by subjecting them to uh, loading in different directions, bending, tension, compression, and um, many other types of loading. We also performed a very comprehensive um, uh, um, parametric modeling study, a study where we changed the design parameters of the structure that we found in insect wings, in the uh, sun beetle wing. And uh, for example, the height of the structure, the thickness of the layers, the width of the structure, even the properties of the layers. And by that, we develop a design space that can be seen here. And we use this, this design space to select the best model for a series of applications um, that we develop later. In the first application, as you can see here, we use the structure, um, this bio-inspired uh, hinge, in fact, as a kind of compliant origami hinge that allowed us to connect any number of modules in a modular design and develop a variety of geometric forms that you can see here in the um, below of this slide that I'm showing now. In the next application, we use the bio-inspired hinge in the design of um, an airless tire that could perfectly adapt uh, to a variety of surfaces, but could still be stiff enough to resist the weight of a small vehicle. And in the snapshot that, uh, um, snapshots that you can see below the, the slide, you can see here, for example, that the structure has perfectly adapted to a, a barrier to, a, to basically a step-like bar barrier. In the other application, we use the compliant joint in the design of a two-dimensional metamaterial, where we, we were able to control the compressive behavior of the metamaterial. So in the force displacement di diagram that you can see here, you see that the structure is initially very flexible. And then at a certain point, then these compliant hinges interlock with each other when the structure is subjected to compression, the stiffness of the structure significantly increases. So we can control this in the first uh, level, we can control the stiffness in the second level, and we can also control where this um, change in the stiffness should take place. You can, you can also see that the metal material is basically a zero Poisson's ratio material. So when we subject it to compression, there is no expansion. Another design inspired by um, insect wings, again, is this multi-degree of freedom um, joint inspired by uh, the coupling mechanism that we have uh, seen in the wings of bees and wasps. So this structure is inspired by this specific structure in the wings of bees and wasps. 
We know that bees and wasps have four wings, two wings on each side. But in order to reduce the aerodynamic interference of the wings, they couple, or in other words, lock their four and hind wings in flight. And this locking of the wings is done by this mechanism that you can see in this SEM image. This, this mechanism is basically has a, has a um, length of about a millimeter. But what is very interesting from an engineering perspective is that this structure, this very tiny structure, is transferring all the forces from one wing to another, is uh, subjected to uh, loads that can uh, uh, reach frequencies up to 500 hertz and works under minimal friction because the two wings have two different joints. So there is always a sliding between the two wings. But this structure, which is basically a mechanical hinge, works under uh, with minimal friction. And there is no evidence that there is any kind of lubrication, which makes the structure very interesting from an engineering perspective. The structure is quite diverse in the wings of different bees and wasps, in the, in the wings of different um, species and cats, and even within the same mechanism, the structure varies quite a lot, especially the design of the hooks that you can see here. So um, some of the hooks are larger, some of them are smaller, some of them are more curved, some of them are less curved, and um, uh, some of them have a completely uniform cross-section, and some of them have a cross-section that changes significantly along the length of the hook. And of course, one of the questions that we were trying to answer, what is the reason behind this diversity? Um, of, to answer the question, uh, we extracted the design parameters of the hooks, the, those design parameters that determine the geometry of the hooks, and we aim to establish a quantitative link between the design of the hooks and their performance, specifically their load bearing capacity. Uh, under uh, different types of loading, especially those loadings that are subjected to in flight, in real insect means. And we used our data uh, to develop bio-inspired joints with very high load bearing capacity. Um, I will share it with you, but prior to that, I would like to share with you these data that are maybe perhaps um, they are more uh, biologically relevant, but quite interesting. And this slide shows the load bearing capacity of the different um, species that we um, um, studied with respect to the body weight of the species. So you can see here um, that uh, social vasps that are shown by the blue color um, have comparatively higher load bearing capacity in comparison to solitary vasps and social bees. And we have an explanation for that. Uh, we know that social wasps, like uh, yellow jackets, paper wasps, and hornets, uh, they are predators and scavengers. Um, these species um, transport their prey that are usually very large uh, to their uh, nest. And perhaps that's why their uh, coupling mechanism, and specifically the hooves, are adapted um, to very high loads, which may explain um, the results that we have found in our uh, study. Anyway, the bio-inspired design is here. So we developed a um, joint consisting of two parts. The two parts can be locked. They can undergo twisting, as you can see in the video. They can undergo a, slot, a sliding. Uh, but the structure is also quite um, load-bearing, both in tension and compression, as you can see. And we can also unlock the two structure, which makes the structure quite interesting for many robotic applications. One may find many applications for this structure, but we thought that maybe it is a good idea to use it in a, car in a kind of cartridge razor where we can lock the handle and cartridge to each other. And you can see that the two can undergo twisting. They, they can be locked, they can, can undergo twisting, and they can also be unlocked. Similar to the structure that we said, we can see in the uh, real system. So what I have shown up to now has been, um, all of them have been inspired by insect wings. Um, we have developed many more designs um, and um, inspired by other uh, body parts of insects. And I would like to show a few examples in the next slides. So uh, one of the first designs uh, that we developed 
um, is this adaptive robotic foot. Uh, this design is inspired by the fibrillar structure that can be found on the feet of many insects. So we know that insects um, can adhere to different surfaces. For example, the smooth surface of a glass or very rough surface of a wall or very rough surface of many plants. So insects can, can walk on surfaces that are stiff, soft, rough, or very smooth. And this um, uh, ability is caused by the uh, adaptive design of the feed and specifically this uh, fibrillar structure that enables feed to adapt to a variety of surfaces. We use this um, after studying the fibrillar structure, we developed the adaptive food and we use the uh, uh, food that we designed uh, to develop robots that can walk on a variety of surfaces, specifically on even surface like the smooth surface of a pipe. And as you can see, that the robot is perfectly um, able to walk on this um, on this surface. This work has been done in collaboration with our colleagues in Southern Denmark University, in Vista in Thailand, and also Kiel University in Germany. And you can see a comparison of our adaptive food um, to this conventional food design uh, that is often used in robots. And you can see that the, the robot with conventional food design is unable to walk on the same surface. Another design um, that we developed uh, just recently, the results have been published uh, recently in the journal um, uh, Royal Society Interface, is this a spiral joint. A spiral, we, we call it programmable a spiral joint. And I'll tell you why we call it in this way. This, this structure is designed um, by inspiration from the elongated mouse parts of, butter, of butterflies. So this structure is really compact, but it can be elongated and this structure enables the insect to reach the nectar that is situated deep down in a flower. In a flower. So inspired by this structure, we have developed adaptive grippers. So adaptive grippers that could conform to objects with a variety of forms. Objects that are flat, objects that are uneven, like what you can see in this video now, and structures that are more complicated in shape, um, different geometric forms like the triangle that you can see here. And this has been achieved by the adaptability of this spiral design, as you can see. And also the structures that are situated on completely different surfaces. And you can see that the spiral design can undergo extension, twisting, uh, a sliding in plane and out of plane. We have also used a combination of spirals to develop grippers um, that can again adapt to a variety of uh, structures that conform to very complicated shapes, curved structure that are um, uh, that have curvature in different directions. But what is really interesting about this design is that with only a few uh, geometric parameters, we can. Uh, reach a high control over the behavior of the joint, um, which enables us to develop grippers with a variety of properties, grippers that are less or more deformable, for example. And we have also developed um, other type of rigid, uh, rigid grippers inspired by the elongated mandibles of stag beetles. Uh, so we know that the stag beetles have developed a variety of uh, mandibles that are very much diverse in shape. Some of them are very slender, some of them are small and bulky, uh, some of them are very much straight, some of them are very much curved, some of them have developed um, very complicated denticles or branches. And of course, one of the questions that in our, in our group we are trying to answer is, what is the reason behind the diversity of um, grippers? Um, in order to answer this question, again, we have used a, a comparative uh, modeling or parametric modeling. We have developed a variety of mandibles where we have changed the design parameters of the 
uh, mandibles that exist in nature, and even we have created those mandibles that do not exist in nature. And we have tried to understand how changing each design parameter influences the function of the mandible. And specifically, we have focused on the grabbing performance of the mandibles because we wanted to make um, grippers with enhanced uh, grabbing performance. And um, as you can see here, uh, we have been able to enhance the load bearing capacity of grippers by several times only by applying very tiny changes in the design of the grippers. So the mandible inspired structures that you can see on the right side of the slide, many of them look more or less similar and they, um, they vary very uh, slightly in shape, but with these as very small changes in the shape, we have been able to increase the load bearing capacity by at least two and a half times. Um, so we have developed many more engineering designs that I can talk about, but um, all of them convey the same concept, achieving adaptability through, um, through increasing the level of intelligence of designs something that we call it as mechanical intelligence. So our belief is that in order to make adaptive structures or shape morphing structures, we do not necessarily need complicated sensing, feedback control, or actuating mechanisms, which make mechanical systems very uh, uh, costly, complicated, and usually very heavy in weight. Many of these can be, in, can be achieved by increasing the level of intelligence of designs inspired by nature. So if you are interested to know more about uh, mechanical intelligence, uh, we have recently published a paper that has been published um, in the journal Advanced Science. If you are interested, I would like to refer you to this uh, paper. We have also published many more papers um, in other journals. If you are interested in the type of research that we do, I would like to refer you to these articles too. Some of our research are among the most impactful research in the, in the field and have been ranked in the top 2% of all research outputs tracked by Altmetric. And the research that we do have been also reflected by many um, uh, science magazines, uh, science news outlets like, like Peace Org, New Atlas, 3D Printing Industry, and also with, uh, uh, by TV channels like NDR and RTL. And of course, what we do uh, have been impossible without the hard work of um, uh, the, our team members. We are currently relatively a small group, but we have very diverse expertise. Among us, you could find mechanical engineers, material scientists, biologists, uh, experts in programming, modeling, and simulations, and also manufacturing. Um, and I would like to end uh, my talk with a very short um, advertisement. If you are a student and you would like to do a PhD in our group, uh, we will have an opening for September um, on a project where we would like to translate nature-inspired solutions to develop hybrid drones with enhanced flight and energetic efficiency. Thank you very much. And that was my talk. Pretty Pleasure. good. Yeah, it, it's really inspiring talk and very impressive. You know? Most of your work uh, is uh, just wrap the last page in a really short. And uh, we wish to, I cannot wait to read your newly published paper in the, in the near future. <laughs> yeah, Thank it's pretty good. Much. Yeah, uh, now we have uh, some time to uh, uh, for the uh, question and answer. And uh, if you have any question, please, uh, just turn on your microphone and ask questions from uh, Dr. Rajabi. Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm. Uh, hi. Hi, this is Wei. Hey, Wei. How are you? Uh, I'm fine. Nice, yeah. nice to have you here. <laughs> yeah, very happy. Uh, your your speech is very engaging. Uh, yeah, I have to say. It's, Thank you. Uh, I very enjoy uh, this journey, uh, and I can't help uh, wondering uh, that uh, the uh, grippers inspired by insect mandibles uh, yeah. can have a uh, very different performance by just changing their 
uh, morphology very slightly. Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm wondering uh, uh, how to achieve this, you know, just a slight change in the morphology uh, can, uh, uh, can cause very uh, remarkable uh, load uh, um, yeah, the, the false output, I think. Uh, yeah. How to achieve this? Um, how to increase the load bearing? Yeah. Okay. So what, what we basically have done, um, we have placed uh, an object between the two mandibles, right? So the experiment that we have done is placing an object between the two mandibles and then increasing the load of the object until we see how much load a mandible can get. But the load that the mandible can resist uh, depends on different things. Of course, the friction between the object and the mandible, but also how the object perfectly fits inside the mandible or the gripper or the binding spark gripper that we develop. So the fact is, when you change the design parameters, you change how the structure, how the object fits inside the mandible because uh, we haven't changed the, the properties of the mandible, we haven't changed the properties of the object. So we assume that the friction remains more or less constant. So um, what we are changing by changing the design of the, of the mandible is um, how well the object fits inside the mandible or um, how good the, two, the object and mandible interlock with each other. So my assumption is when we change the design of the mandible, we are changing this feature. I don't know whether this answers your question. Oh, so the, the main point is to change the uh, contact area? Is yes, to some extent changing the contact area and how well the object fits inside the mandible, yeah. Yeah, I see, thank you, thank you. Yeah, pleasure. Okay. And okay. next, uh, anyone yeah. has a question here? Yeah. Hi. Hello. Uh, hey, you, yes. Uh, uh, thank you for your very nice presentation and uh, so many fantastic uh, by inspired designs. Uh, I have two questions uh, yeah. about uh, dragonflies uh, flying. The first yeah. one is you show the structure of the uh, dragonflies' uh, wings. Uh, microstructure. Uh, yeah. I see one, uh, some uh, images from your sliders. Uh, there is a very uh, small structure that is a scale or joint structure. Can you show that page uh, yeah. on your slider? Sure, I can, I can share it quickly with you. Yes, uh, yeah. yes. Uh, at the bottom, the, the, sec the first and the second. Uh, yeah. Yeah, this is uh, the small. Yes, this is a scale, or or you, you can see from the structure. Oh, yes, the, this, this so structure here. Yeah, yeah, this, this one. Is, oh, yeah. No, uh, no, no, this is no scale. It, it is. These are very small spikes. Uh, let's say a small spike structures that you could structures find in, in the vein. On the yeah, in the on, main on vein the vein. On the okay. vein. Yes. 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 So you 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 could see here. That similar spikes, yeah. not not exactly similar, but many of many spikes are distributed over the surface of the of the wing. But you could also see the spikes that are associated with joints. Yes, here is the joint structure. I, yes, I can this one. From, so, so this is yeah. So this is why we know that works as a kind of mechanical stopper. I don't know whether I have a model of it here. Unfortunately, not. Uh, yeah, sorry, um, because I have 3D printed parts, um, I can't find it now. But yes, this one basically works as a kind of mechanical stopper. So in uh, to some extent, um, so th this is for the yeah, this is for the limitation of the deformation maximum exactly. deformation. Exactly. Okay. Uh, yes, yeah. I'm interested. Actually, I interested uh, for the 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 bottom. Yes, that that structure. Yes. So, what mm -hmm. do you think? Is there any? Uh, Effection for the aerodynamics for this structure. Um, pe people usually uh, hypothesize two different things. Some people say that yes, spikes may be um, uh, may have an aerodynamic effect, uh, but some other people have a completely different hypothesis. They say that spikes could work as a kind of weapon 
because insects, basically, when they are, uh, especially territory, territorial insects like male dragonflies, in order to keep their territory or to access females, they fight with each other. And they use quite a lot their wings against each other. So hitting each other by wings. Yes. And that, that could be to some extent a valid hypothesis, I think. Yeah, is it, uh, maybe, is there anybody uh, already make some experiments about this use of wind tunnels, uh, just like a mimic structure to shoot? I'm, I'm not aware of a very comprehensive study. I may have seen, you know, very small studies, um, but I don't think that there is any, let's say, concrete answer to the question. Okay. Uh, yeah. And as the other question is, uh, can you show us uh, the video of uh, train uh, dragonflies flying? Yeah, the video. this one. Okay, this one. Uh, when the the front wing and hind wing make the uh, same face for flapper, and uh, yeah. when the they make different face or the for different uh, uh, flapping angle. You know, that, that really depends on the state of flight. So if it is about um, uh, most of the time, there is a phase shift of um, a phase shift between the two wings. So it is the hind wing that comes first. And when the hind wing is going up, it is the uh, fore wing that comes down. Right. So it is 90 degree phase shift between the two. Unless in, in a, unless in a very, a very special state, when the insect wants to escape, so the two wings work at, at the same phase, but most of the time there is a ninety degree phase shift. So uh, for for the front wing and the fin, they are active flap flap. Yes, they are they are completely independent from each other, and they work act. Uh, they are both active, but for some insects like bees and wasps that lock their fore and hind wings in flight, so making a large wing, it is according to uh, what I know one of the wings is basically active and it's usually the four wing that is active. So uh, it is the four wings that um, locks into the hind wing and takes the long wing and pushes or uh, pulls the hind wing. Okay, thank you. But thank for, you very much. But, yeah, sure. But for dragonflies, the two wings are completely independent. Yeah. Jianying, um, can you hear me? This yeah, I can hear you. Yes. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. we, can, we can hear hi, you. Hi, hi. Hi, how are you? <laughs> yes. Uh, okay, I should uh, open my videos. Perfect. Nice to see you. Hi, hi. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Congratulations. You have a big group and uh, to be a leader. And so yeah. um, you, you do... Um, you, you have done many uh, good works and uh, made so much uh, excellent products. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, uh, yeah, my question is, um, uh, what kind of materials do you use to, to, produ to produce these uh, products? Um, at the beginning, uh, how to decide uh, your, which kind of the, uh, the materials? Yeah, like, very good question. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. That that's a really good question because most of the time we use very conventional type of materials. The reason is that we want to say, you know, the ideas that, that we take from nature can be translated into engineering, and we can use very common materials that we use in everyday life application mm -hmm. um, in these designs that we develop. So we don't use very specific type of materials that are not accessible mm -hmm. to many people. We usually mm -hmm. use um, PLA, which is a very common uh, material for 3D printing, usually for making very rigid objects or uh, objects that um, even the spiral grippers that, that I showed, these are also made mm -hmm. of PLA, but by change, by, by de designing them in a very certain way, we have been able to make a structures that are quite deformable. If we need very large deformability, we usually use TPU, which is another type of very common material that people use in um, application. Um, here at LSBU, we have the um, access to very different, um, let's say manufacturing equipment, especially 3D printers that are really high tech. And uh, 
we are also going to buy a carbon fiber reinforced um, um, a three D printer that can that can three D print carbon fiber reinforced filaments. But for now, everything that we are producing is made either by PLA or TPU. Okay. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Pleasure. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much. I have some questions, uh, sure. Hamid. The first one is uh, you published one paper to introduce the, uh, the mechanical intelligence uh, like inspired by some biological systems. Yeah. Uh, and do you think uh, the mechanical intelligence is just the subject of uh, mechanical design or some uh, or a combination of the mechanical design, the geometrical properties, and some like material properties. And... I would say combination of everything. You know, everything. Uh, yeah, yeah. Combine, com it could be combination of everything. The the main message of mechanical intelligence is we can develop adaptive structures. You know, um, because we have already adaptive structures. We have mm -hmm. already shape morphing structures. But the main message is why we don't use shape morphing structures in everyday life application. If, you, if mm. you look at everything that is situated next to you in the, in the room that you are sitting, most of the objects that we see around us are very rigid structures, not deformable. And this limits, you know, uh, their, so there are single use, uh, single function, monofunctional structures, while by bringing adaptability and shape morphing pro properties to structures around us, we mm. can not only increase their functionality, but we can give them multi-functionality. And it is oh. something that we haven't achieved in everyday life application. In, in, the structures that we see around us are very old fashioned, right? Mm. Um, they haven't changed since years ago. So the idea is we can develop adaptive structures or shape morphing structures, um, and we can bring them to the uh, to everyday life, life applications by making them simpler. How we can make them simpler? Inspiration from nature. You know, we don't need to have very complicated sensing, feedback, control, or actuating mechanisms. But we can remove many of these, not completely get rid of all of them, but simplifying the designs. Yeah, it all your amazing. designs presented here is uh, pretty uh, far from uh, like complexity, and it's pretty simple, but it has yeah. really solid and stable uh, mechanisms and the functions and yeah it inspires a lot and the second point I uh, am pretty interested in is about the, your future work you know uh, that's the same question as we asked uh, how about the mandibles of the beetles or some insects and it has some uh, tiny structures like the protrusions or some other places did you check the um, like the concrete uh, mechanical um, or the material properties or material ingredients of them and to compare which part is, is uh, like softer and which part is more rigid and uh, what about the function of like for instance grip one uh, object in your hand and uh, how many uh, uh, like factors that will influence the gripping uh, you know stability or something like that that's a very good question that's a very good question i have to admit it's a very nice question but the problem is that no we haven't done that so we have assumed mm -hmm. that the old mandible is uh, one uh, homogeneous material which is wrong mm -hmm. because yeah. we have there are studies that show that there is a huge material gradient in the mandible yeah. of many six right mm -hmm. um but in order to make everything simpler, we have assumed that everything there is, uh, you know, more or less uniform. Um, yeah, <laughs> so the That's answer the is no. <laughs> yeah, because I am investigating one type of like beetles, uh, not the beetles, just one type of man, uh, the ant. The ant can really elongated mandibles and it can clamp in a, at a really short time using that force as one propulsion for us to like make them jump from uh, the ground into a very uh, high place. So uh, we checked the different, uh, like the material uh, properties of different parts and I find that uh, the inner parts is softer and the outer part, part is uh, more rigid. And I'm not sure about um, the real function of the material diversity in this structure and yeah. Probably it is uh, related to some specific functions, and probably it is just there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's my question. And uh, any questions? I can see it. Yeah. 
Yeah, Hi. yeah. Okay. Long Jen. I'm yeah. a. Hi, Long Jen. I'm, I'm a little, yeah. I'm a little uh, for a few minutes. So, but I listen to most of your slides. I am very sure. interesting works. Congratulations. Thank you. And Thank I you very much. To, yeah, I have one, two questions actually. The first Absolutely. question is, um, how do you consider the dimension effect of your designs? Because mm. it, yeah, use your structures are much uh, bigger than the nature exactly. structures. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I think the dimension effect should have some strong effect. But yeah, you are kind of genius the design here. So this is the first question, maybe. Yeah, and the second uh, question again, again, maybe I answered the first one because it's again a very, very good question. It is a very okay. good question. It's a question that that we often face uh, by reviewers that yes, mm -hmm. there is a dimension effect, um, a scaling effect. So uh, most most of the designs that we have developed are scaled up by by several times. The fact is, yes, there is an scaling effect, but most of the time, in many applications that we have developed, we have seen that the structure is functional when we scale it up or even when we scale it down. Um, whether I can say anything more about that, I can say, you know, the only thing that I can say is that um, at least the modeling approach that we have and the manufacturing approach that we have by 3D printing shows that the structure, when we scale up the project, uh, the, the parts and the structure, we see more or less the same effects. It is the only thing that I can say at the moment. Okay, for the for the design, so you have some modeling simulation first, or yes, yes, okay. yes. Okay. So the modeling is more or less done at the same scale, but when we want to make the structure and manufacture it, because we have to apply it to larger scale, you know, engineering applications, um, or more daily life applications, we have to scale it up. Yeah, sure. Okay, thanks for this uh, question. A second is for the last part of work you have these kind of hooks have some small spikes on top yeah so yeah. so uh, i may miss some some parts so what's the function of these small spikes on top and um, the small spikes on the joints are basically mechanical stoppers so no no no, the no, no, no. okay okay mm -hmm. oh. and, yeah so and the that, joints that, that part for for this uh of the hooks like uh, like small spikes here, not on the wings of the. Oh, on the on the mandibles, you mean on the mandibles? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. on the mandibles, they are they are basically they call it um if they are larger they call it denticles and if they are very small they call it teeth. Mm -hmm. So basically, oh, it is very important because mandibles are used in a variety of ways. So um one of the one of the answers to the to the shape diversity of mandibles of insects is that especially stag beetles, why we have chosen a stag, maybe I, I have to tell this introduction. We have chosen a stag beetles because stag beetles use the mandibles for one specific function and that's fighting. So mandibles are not used for anything else, not eating, you know, not digging holes, nothing, just fighting. And that makes a stag beetles really unique uh, systems to investigate the shape, the reasons behind shape diversity because if all the mandibles are used for one function, which is uh, fighting, why we have these many diverse mandibles, diverse from a morphological perspective? So it is a question that we are trying to answer, and we have a hypothesis for that. Yes, there is a shape diversity. Yes, they are used for this for one function, which is fighting, but they are used in variety of ways. What does that mean? That means that, for example, some of the stag beetles use their mandibles to cut the body parts of opponents. Some of them use the mandibles to push the opponent. Some of them use to, um, let's say, squeeze the body parts of the rivals, right? So those ones that have teeth are basically those ones that use to damage the body parts of opponents, like cutting or a scratching or something like that. So these teeth, to my eyes, are basically uh, something like, you know, how we use our teeth to uh, tear up uh, food, but they use their mandibles or the teeth which situated on the mandibles to damage the body parts of the opponent. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. And, yeah, and uh, do they have some uh, particular uh, kind of anchor or something? Yes, they have very, in, this is very interesting because as you have seen in the modeling part that we had, we seem, we changed very, we applied very minor changes to the geometry of the mandibles. So what we have done, in one case, we have only changed the direction of the teeth from one angle 
multiply the ideal to 10 degrees or five degrees, and we have been um, achieving higher load bearing capacity. So it means that even this directionality of um, denticles or teeth could significantly influence the function of the mandible, yes. Okay, that's interesting. Maybe another thing I'm not sure about also about this, do they have some some particular some alignment of some 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 nanostructures inside? Um, uh, I, have, I I can answer that because I haven't checked the microstructure, but we mm -hmm. know that there is a microstructure and the mm -hmm. microstructure changes in different parts. So it is very likely that the answer is yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Pleasure. Very interesting talk. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, we have only one question, please. Sure. And if you have any, any question, please uh, just uh, switch on your microphone to ask. Yeah. Only one. <laughs> yeah. If no, can I ask a, another question for yeah, the students? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. So how do you find this kind of interesting structures for your research? For basically, group, kind of, yeah, yeah. yeah, basically what, what we do, um, and sometimes by coincidence, <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> um, sometimes um, suggestion of colleagues. And, but most of them, you know, when we chose, when, when, when we choose uh, uh, structures around us, what we really um, concern about, uh, we are con concerned about is what makes this uh, structure quite unique? So, for example, we have, we have uh, studied the tibia of some insects. And the question was, how these uh, structures that are super slender and normally should fail simply under compression, should buckle simply under compression, they don't buckle. And they can resist the force caused by the weight of the insect and the weight, you know, uh, and not only the weight of the insect, but, but the force that goes several times of the, of the insect body, body weight, because, you know, the insect is walking and running, and we know that during running, uh, the forces can reach over two and a half times of the body weight. But this structure, you know, works in a way that we don't expect. So these surprising uh, observations, like, like for example, I, I also told, told about the, this structure that we have found in the hind wing of this, of the membrane of the sun beetle, we have seen this structure and we know that in every other studied insect, the membranes are two layers completely fused. But here, the, there is a gap between the membrane, which is quite unique. And it happens only and only in a certain part of the wing, not any other region of the wing, right? So very surprising observations tells us, okay, maybe this is a study, this, this is um, the structure that we should study. Yeah, I think I also discussed with my students. Said okay, you should pay attention to the to the nature nature around you. you many things are very interesting. Something from the, some basic, um, let's say, knowledge of physics or chemistry should be that way, but have this actually the opposite direction. The functions. Absolutely. Then you may think why it happens. Then you may think to okay, maybe something new mechanism behind them we can use it to design some new materials new new machines new new structures yeah exactly, we exactly. share the so, same concept yes yeah curiosity in fact yes okay thank you very much yeah yeah sure pleasure thank you thank you thank you all all, all your page uh, all your uh like passion and thank you so much and uh, this is the uh i guess this is the end of our talk today and we really appreciate uh, Dr. Rajabi uh, for sharing such a wonderful talk with us. Yeah, Pleasure. that's all. Thank you yeah. so much. Yeah. See you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Yeah. And have a nice Thank evening you. here. Yeah, Take have care. a nice day. See you. Bye. Enjoy the sunshine. It looks very sunshine outside. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's fully cloudy, <laughs> just light. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.